Jason, thanks for coming on the show. Thanks, Dan. Pleasure to be here. Yeah, yeah, for sure. So, and thanks again for having me on, on your podcast, Test Optimize Scale. And um, f- so it's, we're talking a bit today about, about investor crowdfunding and equity crowdfunding. And it's kind of weird. Like I remember, you know, working, uh, selling animated explainer video services in New York in like circa like 2011, 2012 or so. And that was, that seems to be when there were like these massive funding rounds. This was when like WeWork was getting really big and I'd go to like whatever various networking events. Uh, I remember I used to go to one in the basement of the Wall Street Humidor and it was like a cigars and scotch meetup. And one of these, uh, I won't say the name, but yeah, it was, it was, it was a lot of fun. And it was like, I can't believe that you're paying to have me here and and I'm worthless right now. Like I'm just some sales guy for an animation studio. (laughs) Um, and they, and it was a, it was like a a PEO, you know, uh, one of these HR organizations that their salespeople just had like blank checks to throw this event. And that was, so to me, I kind of slot equity crowdfunding into like that. I remember hearing about it then, because that's when like, I think I might be wrong, but I think that's when reg D and these new regulations were getting big. And then I just didn't hear about it for like the last, the better part of a decade now. Um, so I'd love to hear like what, you know, what is it, what is equity crowdfunding for those that don't know? Let's just start there. <laughs> Absolutely. And again, excited to be here as your episode on, on my show, Test Optimize Scale, has been one of the more popular recent uh, episodes among fans. So, okay. you know, continuing this conversation has uh, been a highlight for me this week. And uh, yeah, equity crowdfunding was first introduced to me in 2014. So Reg D, what you're talking about, uh, 506C, which allows for uh, promotion to accredited investors. An accredited investor, over a million dollars net worth or a 200K individual uh, income over the past three years. Uh, There's a combined number for that as well, too. So we were very limited on who we could market to at that point. I would use data with my background in ad tech to go after high net worth, high household income, uh, high risk, high return, private equity type uh, investors. Mm -hmm. And we were taking them down funnels to then connect with the founders. And then there was this anticipation towards new regulation, Title III of the Jobs Act, Reg CF, regulation crowdfunding, uh, which didn't take place till May of 2016. That allowed us to market to both accredited and unaccredited investors. Essentially, any adult, there are some restrictions around it. But when you hear the term retail investors, when you see uh, individuals participating on apps regularly, such as Robinhood, they're also investing in these early stage private equity deals at this point. There's another filing, just to throw another legal term at everybody, of Regulation A+, Reg A+, uh, which allows you to, to raise more a far more in-depth level of due diligence and paperwork that has to be submitted by legal and finance teams, almost similar uh, and described as a mini IPO. So far more in-depth, but to give you some contrast, Reg CF up until March of this year, you could raise 1.07 million. So almost- And that's, sorry to cut you off. So that's 1.7 million and, and that's potentially anybody and their mother could invest in that just without and get equity in the company through crowdfunding. Exactly. And that recently expanded to 5 million, uh, March 15, monumental in the world of equity crowdfunding. Uh, Reg A Plus also saw an expansion from 50 to 75 million. But again, far more complications involved. We usually see a delay when a company is doing a Reg A Plus. But it's very interesting because it will be attracting much larger scale groups at the $75 million level. And you picture 20% of the company being offered and a you know, nine figure type valuation uh, that the, uh, the organization is, is based on. Right. makes sense. So, so with that, you know, it sounds like we had uh, new legislation and kind of like circa 2010 and then it's now sort of starting to, to take shape. And, you know, there's, there's different ways that you and, and your friends or whoever can invest in these companies and, and kind of own a, own a chunk of them. So with that, um, what, what are the types of companies that you're seeing take advantage of this? Like how, how is this panning out? Great question. As many people think it's really just one type of company of, Oh, Hey, this is tech hardware. Uh, these days, SaaS is becoming more popular. It's just SaaS companies, but it's across the board from mom and pops, some of the early successes for Reg CF were breweries and, and local businesses that would promote this offering to their patrons 
and get a small amount, maybe a few hundred dollars on average from a few thousand uh, backers, uh, whether they're, <clears throat> again, uh, existing customers, future customers, or just admiring of the, the overall model and see the potential for growth, uh, all the way up to AI. Uh, we've had very successful solar companies, automated retail, uh, emerging verticals such as uh, cannabis and CBD, really across the board, biotech and medtech have been huge over the past 12 months, particularly with the mainstream uh, education around different types of uh, medical topics, uh, including the pandemic. And some of the groups uh, have been uh, working on solutions around that, uh, but, but all encompassing of early stage detection uh, for major health issues such as cancer. So uh, anything that's new, anything that's different, or shows the potential for growth. And the opportunity for the, the issuer, the brand that's issuing stock, is to get, uh, there's different terms around investors, but uh, investors who then become customers, who become ambassadors. So you're marketing to you know, both audiences, uh, you know, twofold. Yeah. And I guess with that, has there been like a big, I know there's, it sounds like there's lots of, of wins and lots of companies that have made these rounds work really well, but has there been kind of like a, a major Cinderella story yet of somebody using one of these to actually get to like an IPO or something massive like that? Yes. Uh, one example that's pointed at regularly is uh, Beyond Meat. Uh, they raised on a platform called Our Crowd International Platform. Uh, in the US here, Start Engine, We Funder Republic are the top three. I can name 10 others that are, are close behind. Um, our crowd uh, works off different uh, regulation being international, uh, but they did a raise there, uh, Beyond Meat IPO'd. Uh, there, there's several other uh, success stories uh, that, are, that are similar. Uh, we're looking forward to more of those taking place following uh, a traditional timeline, three to five years, five to seven years based on the brand's trajectory. Uh, but that's one that people are already pointing at. Right, right. That makes sense. And let's move this to you guys a little bit. So I'd love to learn a little bit more about how you guys are uh, are, are soliciting investors and in and, and dealing with you know that that whole thing. I think that's kind of a very interesting niche space and just kind of what you're up against uh, marketing there. Absolutely. So I, I came from ad tech and we founded DNA, Digital Niche Agency, in 2014. And we didn't start as a investor acquisition company uh, as much as a growth marketing agency working with startup to mid-market brands, uh, which for me is very exciting. It's very rewarding uh, coming from ad tech, working with a lot of top 100 advertisers. I was another line item among 100 other vendors for, let's say, a mobile hardware, mobile software company. Uh, studio entertainment, the whole, the whole uh, vertical of, of major brands. But uh, working with brands at this stage, we're directly part of their growth. It's very exciting, uh, fulfilling when it's working. Comes with a lot of obstacles, but we like the pressure. We like the uh, excitement over here at the, the offices. Uh, but uh, yeah, we're, we're part of the evolution of these brands that we're working with. And we found fundraising to be a common theme, a common initiative, whether groups were you know, speaking to angel investors or in a pitch process with VCs. Maybe we were working on their marketing materials, putting the marketing section together of their business plan, even participating in these meetings. So when we were first introduced to the Reg D portals, the sites that host these deals, light bulb went off. I'd even been part of an offline raise years before that was successful, but was strenuous work. There was extensive you know, edits to the deck. Over 75, we were constantly hustling to maybe get a chance to pitch an investor. So these platforms and being able to bring investors and issuers together were very exciting to me. Uh, we, uh, you know, I was touching on a little bit with Reg D and using data to reach those investors. Advertising has always been a big part of what we do. That's how we're leveraging the data. Uh, we then really tried to hone in on the strategy process as we found a lot of these brands were not as mapped out in their approach as some of the larger corps that I had worked with in the past. So I uh, built a system called the eight point plan, written about it in Forbes, lead workshops on it. It's our approach towards a marketing strategy. Research every at first with the uh, industry overview and competitor marketing audit, lays out the framework of the plan, the audiences, the channel, the, the creative that's gonna go into each of those. We, we 
do a whole section. We dedicate a portion to strategic partnerships and build a perspective map and messaging sequence as we've seen things grow the quickest there. And then everything feeds into projections. The only way to measure is with numbers. So we put together algorithms of impressions, clicks, and conversions, those three stages, impressions, clicks, conversions, so that we can identify what's working, what's not working, focus optimizations at the stages where performance is falling off below benchmarks, and then cap it all up with a activation section, more or less an executive summary, to then activate across our three areas of focus, content, ads, outreach. We build content marketing funnels, drive traffic into with ads, and do uh, direct outreach for strategic partnerships, influencers, and on these investor campaigns directly to uh, you know high net worth individuals. And that's how we've been able to build our portfolio. Yeah, well, let's talk about that a little bit. So I'd love to just understand um, the demographic for these types of investors a little, a little bit more. Is, is it changed at all? Is it just, you know, various rich people? You know, you hear a lot about the Robin Hood trolls on Reddit or whatever. Like how, how, have, how have things changed and who, how are you typically identifying, uh, you know, the, the right cohort uh, in any given situation? Yeah, great question. So, you know, in the audience section of the strategy, we're always putting together new targets. And we start with four to 10. We may map it out as three and then include a retargeting audience. So we're focusing on the individuals who've already been to the offering page, but somewhere in that ballpark. So we have variants, we're able to compare the results. We have assumptions going in, but we always want the analytics to tell us what's working and not working. Uh, In those audience segments, uh, household income, net worth are a big factor as it is generally an indicator of a range that they can invest. You have an idea of, you know, if somebody makes 50K or 500K, how much they're going to be able to invest and the conversion rate uh, and and, uh, overall, uh, I I call it sales cycle, the timeline from when they're first presenting a piece of marketing and close uh, that that are going to follow. Uh, Impulse can be tougher uh, when you get to, lower levels of, uh, of income and, and net worth. So we, we map it out with that along with affinity, meaning do they have an interest in this industry? Uh, are they following pages on social media platforms of similar products? Are they searching around uh, for keywords around this vertical? What is their understanding, their level of education, their level of expertise? Uh, we also market to peers. So if someone invests, are there any ways to market to the audiences around them, uh, which is something we could do uh, on on social. And uh, I would say most importantly is targeting historical equity crowdfunding, investment crowdfunding investors. If we're working on a platform, uh, if we're working on a campaign on on Start Engine or or WeFunder, we want to go after investors who have already participated on those portals because they've gone through the signup process the education around what equity crowdfunding is can be much lighter. Uh, the level of trust of buying shares from a private uh, com- company online um, is, is higher. There, there's more of an understanding of what's occurring. So if we're able to target uh, levels of a certain financial demographic who have an affinity for uh, that type of space, that industry, that vertical, and they've invested on that platform before, that is far more likely than a cold audience who does not fit any of that criteria. Right, right. That makes sense. And from what we, what you can tell, how much is the pie growing? Like how many first-time investors are, are moving into the space from in your experience? Yeah. You know, we're watching the numbers. There's these platforms uh, that track the, uh, the analytics. King's Crowd is one that's great. And it shows all the live deals investors, everything that's happening in the space, how much is raised each month, and it's growing month over month, had a massive uh, spurt in uh, in March. But uh, over the past 12 months, actually, since the, the, the stay-at-home orders were released in March, everything's gone up. Uh, the retail investors, you mentioned Robinhood, regardless of the platform, have skyrocketed since then. And, and incrementally, it has not been just a fad. It's been continuing to grow at first with people at home and having more time uh, later based on the success that others were seeing and uh, their uh, surrounding social circles, joining these type of platforms, looking for other opportunities online and finding equity crowdfunding. So uh, 
the, the, the platforms also track, uh, you know, how many investors have participated. Uh, we funders at about a million investors right now. Over the past few months, we've been watching that go up from 600,000. There's constantly new investors that are joining uh, by, in, in place of, uh, by, by place of activating on one of these investment deals on a daily basis. And uh, I, I should highlight more, talked about it a bit. I'm mentioning financial income, but uh, future customers, being able to market to them with the investment opportunity and then have them purchasing the product, maybe at a discount if it's a perk and promoting it to their friends and family are also are, are, are looked at as a premium target these days. So who may buy this product in the future? Instead of just presenting them with the uh, purchase opportunity or lead form, depending on the industry, uh, let, let, let's get them to invest. From there, they're going to be far more likely to be a, a regular, frequent uh, backer of the business. Yeah, that, that makes sense. So it sounds like there's there's lots that you guys are doing to kind of identify past investors, friends and family, you know, tracking and all that stuff. Um, with that in mind, you know, what what constraints are you under legally? I know that the investment world's different than the other world. So like what 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 lanes do you have to stay in and how much interpretation is there that you can do? Sure, absolutely. And you know, I, I really try to stay in our lane of marketing here. And we work off of what's been signed off by legal to make sure we're compliant in whatever it is we're doing. So the filing uh, goes by a, a CPA who specializes in these type of campaigns in the majority of scenarios. There's generally legal involved and the offering page itself, whether there's a, a lawyer on the issuer side, that's the brand issuing stock, uh, or, or the portal, the site that hosts you know 100 or more of these deals in many cases, there is someone who is counsel that is making sure everything is compliant about the deal as everything's regulated uh, by you know, FINRA, the SEC, uh, the, the actual offering statements are submitted and approved uh, before being placed on one of these sites. So we'll then take highlights of what's on the page. If we're variating from that in any sense, uh, we'll make sure we're getting sign off from the team. Because uh, there are a stringent set of rules and uh, you know criteria around forward-looking statements, uh, so on and so forth. So uh, if we're pulling the the key messaging from the the page, adding some more creativity to it, especially around the visuals, uh, but being able to bring audiences in from paid advertising, from organic content marketing, and direct outreach to that funnel of the offering page, we're uh, generally in a safe place. And I'm happy to say that there's very little stories around uh, scams or, or fraud in this space because it's being submitted you know, be, uh, to the SEC because everything's getting signed off. Even in reward crowdfunding on sites like Kickstarter and Indiegogo, you hear far more uh, stories of uh, groups that did something different than uh, what they're init initially promoting on their page. Right, because there's there's that kind of skin in the game aspect um, of of equity and so on. So before we got cut off uh, through technical issue, I was talking about how I was reading this book called The Scent of Money, and it makes it by Neil Ferguson, great book. It's about the history of money. It talks about how you know the innovations that we've made in finance are just as important, just as pivotal as the tech innovations that we think about, like the internet or going to going to uh, the moon or, or whatever else. And it talks about the bond market and all of these things. And it's, it sounds like like equity crowdfunding and investor crowdfunding is, is the next version of that. It seems like we're going to find ways to capitalize like really interesting and compelling ideas and so on. Um, and, and with that, the other, the other trend that I picked up on in the ascent of money is how, how all of these new, uh, these new innovations in finance always have their own, you know, scandal. They have their own big scandal that kind of shakes everything up like an earthquake. And then we get more regulation or we get, hopefully, you know, get something that's, that's more trustworthy or safe, arguably so. So I'd love to hear your thoughts on that. Like, assuming you agree, do you think that scandal has happened, uh, or, or already, and it wasn't publicized enough in this space, or do you think it's still ahead of us? So I just love to hear your thoughts on that. Yeah, I wouldn't disagree with the theory as an overall concept. For equity crowdfunding, I wouldn't say there's anything I could point at to say, ooh, that, that was a scandal. I could certainly tell you about organizations that raised and unfortunately are no longer in business. Uh, that is an inherent obstacle investing in, in private equity. And that's why you, know, you look at these funds 
and different VCs and their, their talent in due diligence and being able to pick out which companies are going to survive and, and, and really grow, thrive uh, at that. Uh, they, they have models that if one out of 10 of the deals really hit, it pays for the other nine. Many groups have a, a much greater success rate than that, I should add. But those are some of the baselines when approaching uh, high risk, high return investments. And this should really live in that section of the portfolio for any retail investor. Uh, you know, minimum investments can be $100 to, to $500. That's a very common range. They can be higher than that. Uh, but most of the deals sit somewhere in there. The portals will actually push to $100, $250. They, they want more investors to, to sign up on their portal and can do so by, by getting in at a low cost. Because it's you know that type of price point, there, there should hopefully not be too many horror stories for the investors of people losing the house, you know, losing the car. Uh, I should add, you know, for Reg CF, there's limitations for how much any one individual can invest based on their income, based on their net worth. Uh, so that that type of scenario is is far less likely. Uh, the Reg Ds, the credit investors, actually far less regulation because it's supposed to be looked at as uh, investors who are presented with these deals regularly participate in the education is supposed to be different. Uh, but because of those factors, I have not seen too much that is outside of the ordinary in terms of private equity investing. Right, right. That, that makes sense. Um, and, and with that, to kind of bring this to our audience a little bit, a lot of them are our marketing agency leaders. Um, can you talk about what is going on on the ground when these companies are going through these rounds? Like what, what needs do they have marketing wise um, for marketing themselves? Not necessarily what you guys do to get investors, but you know, what, what's, what, what's the sort of thing that they're scrambling to figure out, if that makes sense? Sure. It, you know, is really a, a wide range. Uh, we see the full spectrum. Some groups come to us and say, run advertising to spec. Here's exactly what we want on each channel. Others say, we have nothing. We don't even know where the files are that uh, we used for the, the images on the offering page. It's, it's usually somewhere in between uh, where we're getting a you know, Google Drive folder with some assets and building advertising creative, building uh, organic creative to, to constitute uh, our, our, <clears throat> our flows on email, social media, uh, anything we're doing for digital PR, we're, we're coordinating these webinars quite often, uh, monthly for, for many clients. We could do updates on the platform, which go to select audiences uh, on there. We're doing a bi-weekly blog in many cases. Uh, all of this to build an engaging funnel. It could be seven touch points or more before an investor converts. So I see a lot of opportunity for creative agencies to get involved, really polish out the brand before going live on one of these portals. Uh, obviously, the uh, strategy around it, I mentioned we're working on it, but potentially even a larger brand strategy on where that brand fits in the ecosystem, what makes them uh, stand out, um, what positions them for more market share, those types of uh, in-depth marketing that are very present at the larger brand level, but, but at times could be less common for startup entrepreneur type marketing where people want to hop right in and see results real quick. Uh, also SEO, uh, PR, if there is a groundswell of this for six months before an equity crowdfunding campaign goes live, obviously the brand's going to be far more visible. And social proof, third-party validation really goes a long way uh, on the internet, let alone in this game. So, uh, you know, there, there's definitely a uh, possibility to incorporate more agencies pre, during, based on all the tactics I just mentioned, and then post to take that momentum and, and run with it. Uh, let's say you get a, a thousand investors at a thousand dollar average each to do a million dollar round there, or, you know, multiply that times five for a $5 million round. How do you keep that audience engaged? How do you get them to promote? How do you put, uh, you know, copy out there that they're going to repeat to their circles? That are, that those are all the questions that marketing agencies should be asking when speaking to any issuer of an equity crowdfunding campaign. Yeah. And with that, it, it seems like from the outside looking in, I don't know if this is true, um, that it, it often tends to be kind of like, 
fun, uh, maybe consumer emphasized products like but beyond burger, you know, um, uh, crypto and that sort of thing. Uh, is that, is that changing? You know, are there, are there also more kind of like esoteric, uh, B2B companies getting into the space? Like, how do you see that playing out? Definitely changing. Um, the overall growth trajectory stands out to investors on these portals who, who maybe came in for, uh, a more exciting product to them. Uh, there's many B2B professionals who find software as a service for CRMs to be <laughs> exciting because they have that firsthand relationship with it. They're on these platforms every day. Uh, B2B is definitely an emerging vertical uh, among these platforms. So, uh, you know, there's somewhat of a formula that these campaigns follow, uh, similar to a reward crowdfunding. Uh, success, uh, best practice, where you need to bring the initial audience. Yeah, you, you reach out to your first degree connections. So if that's a B two B audience, and you're bringing fifty, a hundred people who are putting in a thousand dollars each, that's your first fifty grand, hundred grand. Now the portals are promoting you because they have benchmarks that you need to hit uh, before they promote you. And then that type of system all the way up, cause they need to treat each issuer the same. There can't be any favoritism following the guidelines of the, the SEC. So, uh, if you're able to bring that initial groundswell, get the existing investors on that site to back this opportunity, invest into it, then bring marketing to it, retarget people who've hopped off, uh, who found the page organically, send advertising from historical audiences over to the offering you know, continue to, to ramp it up, have new updates each week. There, there are trends that are, uh, you know, commonalities when you look at any successful campaign. So regardless of the vertical, <clears throat> if those elements are present, uh, I've seen campaigns that would be looked at as boring years back as exciting. And, and I like to think of good marketing as making boring industries uh, exciting to begin with, you know air conditioning companies, lawyers, there, there's all these verticals that, you know, years back were thought to be not the best for advertising. And you'll see traditional media, digital media that uh, really built a strong campaign around it. Yeah. Yeah. That's a good point. Um, and kind of, kind of getting towards the end of our time, if you don't mind kind of getting into, into your company and how you've kind of grown it and everything, um, it sounds like, you know, for what you guys have had to do, it's been a lot about strategic partnerships, like getting in touch with, with finance people and that sort of thing. Um, so I'd love, love to just kind of hear your thoughts on that. Like what's worked. I think that a lot of the times, um, salespeople and, and BD people, you know, struggle to find a good way to build strategic partnerships and and have mutual value and and handle those things the right way over like a longer time horizon. So I just lo lo would love to hear your experience with that. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. So uh, I could tell you as of this week, we've worked with over 465 brands since 2014. Uh, we evolved further and further into equity crowdfunding uh, as uh, the request continued to grow. It became a common inquiry. So over 200. Uh, fundraising campaigns. And the majority of those have been through a referral, meaning a website company who said, hey, these guys need more traffic. A lawyer who stated, I just worked on the filing, that they really need to talk to somebody about marketing. Uh, I can name 10 other types of professional services that we've had these type of relationships with where we complement their core offering. Uh, we bring a lot more visibility from the right audiences to make uh, you know, the, the company's overall goal more obtainable. And it's been in instrumental uh, in our growth model and being able to hit those type of client volumes. Uh, we are doing more of our own marketing these days too. Google search ads, Facebook ads that uh, lead to a lead form that autofills and just go into email drips and get forwarded to uh, business development uh, team members at, at DNA go on a discovery call, put together a proposal. And on any of these, we're really just trying to have a warm marketing chat. Uh, whether it turns into a deal or not, we want to be able to share our insights. That's why we put out content such as this uh, with great yeah. partners. Uh, and uh, we, we want to be able to shed, shed that expertise, show case studies, give the actual numbers of what any of these campaigns produced. We want to be an open book so that there could be more success industry-wide 
in equity crowdfunding. And yeah. by coming from that standpoint versus the sales, hey, we want to take over the industry uh, type of perspective, it's been uh, it's been a space where we can build relationships right and left, really contribute to the industry, and we're all excited for the uh, you know rising tides to lift all ships. In general, we look at institutional groups that want to get involved and where the industry could be in three to five years. And it's really a, an exciting moment for everyone. Yeah, makes a lot of sense and seems very uh, tried and true. So, um, Jason, thanks so much for your time, man. Appreciate it. And how can people get in touch with you? Yeah, uh, LinkedIn's great for me. It's Jason Fishman uh, on, on LinkedIn. Uh, you could reach us at digitalnicheagency.com and uh, on the comment board, you put my name, my team will connect you and any social platform at that, but LinkedIn and through the site are going to be the quickest. Awesome, man. Thanks again. Thanks, Dan.